So in this talk, I'm going to describe and explain data availability sampling, proto-dink sharding, and dink sharding. If you haven't heard these terms before, this is somewhat new developments in the blockchain space. Those are being pioneered by the Ethereum Foundation. And those effectively will come to shard our blockchains to make them more scalable, but do so in a much, much simpler way compared to the ideas for sharding that we had before. Since a number of projects are working on data availability solutions, I hope it's helpful to show how some of the best schemes work so that others could either improve on those and pick up perhaps an idea for research project from this work or incorporate these ideas into their own projects. So I'll start uh, with explaining what problem Ethereum is trying to solve here. I'll show where it fits onto the roadmap. I'll explain exactly what will be achieved by uh, this upcoming upgrade, and I'll briefly explain how this is going to be done. So the main goal of this upcoming upgrade is to help Ethereum scale. And Ethereum L2s, or rollups, effectively already help scale the execution of transactions. This L2s take some subset of transactions and process them off-chain. The chain only sees the post effect of these transactions, so Ethereum validator set effectively doesn't have to execute those transactions, those executions are happening off-chain. Gas fees are typically a good indicator of whether we are making the blockchain more scalable, so if the gas fees go lower, it means it's cheaper for the validators to process these transactions, so we make the blockchain more scalable. So if you look at the gas fees, on the L2s, they're typically, you know, six to 30 times smaller compared to transacting directly on Ethereum. But if we dive deeper and dissect the gas costs on each of the rollups, for example, if we look into optimism, we will see that most of the transaction fees go to L1 data fees. So those fees go to storing transactions, storing data on an Ethereum L1. And only a tiny fraction only the top kind of gray area shows you how much you pay for the actual execution fees on the L2. So we can make rollups even cheaper if we lower the cost of storing data on the Ethereum L1. And that's what Ethereum is trying to do with this upgrade that I'm going to explain in this talk. So there were a number of proposals for how to make Ethereum scale and how to make storing data cheaper. Some of the initial ideas were around full sharding. Full sharding effectively splits your large blockchains into smaller blockchains and tries to sync between them. That's a very complicated design. And the nice thing about the current state of Ethereum is that rollups are effectively already doing part of the split. They take some of these transactions and execute them themselves. And then they use the Ethereum L1 in order to sync between those rollups. So L2s already kind of went into the direction of full sharding. So the only thing that the Ethereum blockchain really needs to do for the rollups to become even cheaper is to allow them to store data with lower fees. So full sharding was kind of replaced with another two proposals, at least for now. Those have very similar names, EIP4488 and EIP4844. EIP stands for Ethereum Improvement Proposal. So don't mix them up, they're pretty different. The 4488 was proposing to make call data cheaper, but instead Ethereum decided to focus on another proposal, EIP4844, which suggests to add data which will have an expiry. So the Ethereum will now store some data blobs, some data fragments that it will expire and erase after some period of time. The current thinking is uh, it's going to be one to two months of guaranteed storage. EIP is also called colloquially proto dank sharding. So that's what Ethereum is implementing right now. It's mostly implemented and it should be uh, incorporated into Ethereum pretty soon. So if we look into the roadmap for Ethereum and where those upcoming upgrades fit in there, the merge is already done. So the next is helping rollups scale. So the protodank sharding will come first and the protodank sharding will follow that. Still requires a bit of a research and there are a number of open problems still to be solved. So why rollups need the blockchain to store some data without executing them? That's kind of a one-slide explanation of what a rollup is and why it needs to store some data onto Ethereum L1. So rollups are processing transactions from the users of chain. They're kind of taking all of these transactions, executing them, and instead of relaying them to the L1, they're only posting 
a single transaction that reflects the effect of all of those uh, green transactions on the right. So this transaction, TX, is going to update the state transition. It's going to update the Merkle root hash of account balances, effectively, or account states from S to S prime, and will only be allowed to do so if it can present a commitment to the transaction list on the left, so the commitment to the user transactions, and the valid proof that the state transition conforms to these uh, transactions and then use the commitment that those transactions are valid. So the transaction is really succinct because the root state is small, the commitment is typically also very small. This proof can be there or may not be there depending on the type of the rollup we're talking about. If it's zero knowledge rollup, this will be a zero knowledge proof. Then the size of the proof will depend, of course, on the type of the proof system that the rollup is using. Uh, if it's an optimistic rollup, then the proof will not be there and will be fraud proof that's based. So the clients will have an opportunity to raise a dispute if they think that the state transition was done incorrectly. Those transaction lists needs to be made available in order for the rollup to be uh, fully trustless. What it means is that the rollup should be replaceable. Anybody, if the rollup goes down, becomes malicious, disappears, Anybody can replace the state of the rollup by restoring its state. In order to restore the state and get all of the account states of the users underneath the rollup, this new entity, new rollup, needs to replay all of the transactions. And in order to replay transactions, it needs to download them from somewhere. So that's why rollups are storing this transaction list on some data availability solution. And typically, that's an Ethereum blockchain itself. So that's where most of the gas costs for rollups go. And if Ethereum can make it cheaper for rollups to store those transaction lists, it will make the rollups fees cheaper. So if we look into Ethereum block size today, it's pretty small, only about uh, 100 kilobytes, so 0.1 megabyte per single block. One block appears every 12 seconds. Now with protodenk sharding, the suggestion is to expand the block size with additional data, so about 0.5 megabytes of data. The main purpose of this data is availability. Validators will not have to do any processing on this data. They will need to make it available only. So we will maintain this 100 kilobytes data for execution, but we'll add an additional 500 kilobytes for storage. The storage data for protodenk sharding is going to be fully replicated between the validators and it will have an expiry of one to two months. This data will not be accessible to execution, only a digest of the data will, some hash of the data. And the main users for this data are going to be rollups. And then what will come next is denk sharding. It will expand the data even further and the hope is that it will grow as large as 30 megabytes, which is mind-blowing. So this data will have the same property as for protodenk sharding. It will have an expiry. It will not be accessible to execution, but the validators will be storing this data and will be serving it to the clients. The reason why we can make this second jump from 0.5 megabytes to 30 megabytes will be the main focus of my talk. I will explain how this expansion is possible without making the validators store more data. So storage of this data is going to be distributed among the validators instead of replicated. Validators will not be storing 30 megabytes for each block. They will cleverly split this data and only store small fragments of each block. So if you look into Ethereum state size, in order to be processing transactions, each validator needs to store about 100 gigabytes of data in order to verify and execute transactions. So protodenk sharding will grow the storage requirement a little bit since we add this additional data that the validators will now need to store for a month or two months. The state is going to grow to about 200 to 400 gigabytes. And then with denk sharding, despite the fact that we're going to increase the block size, the storage on the validator side is going to stay roughly the same because the storage data will now be split between the validators instead of fully replicated. So with Dink sharding, validators will still keep about 200 up to 400 gigabytes of data in order to execute transactions. So let's see what protodenk sharding is. Protodenk sharding introduces a new transaction type called blob carrying transaction. Each transaction of this type will submit a long data vector and a short commitment to this vector, which is going to be signed by the user. The thinking right now is that the number of these vectors will be initially pretty small, two, three, or four, and the size of each of the vectors is about 130 kilobytes. 
So that's the rough sizes. I guess Ethereum plans to see how the validators react to that and then maybe increase or decrease this number. So this data is going to expire in one to two months. So the validators will drop the data blobs, but they're going to keep the commitments. So the commitments persist. And blob data will have separate fee market. So cool data is the cheapest way to store data in Ethereum. Right now, it costs about 16 gas per one byte. This blob data is going to cost one gas per one byte, but there's going to be a separate fee market for this blob data. So we don't really know right now until it's been implemented and running how this gas 2 compares to gas 1. That remains to be seen. So let me explain you the commitment scheme that Protodink Shani is going to use. I was saying that we will use a commitment scheme here to commit to the uh, data vector. Now, uh, hash is a, a good commitment scheme. So you can just hash a data vector and it's going to be a binding commitment. But we will do something more clever called polynomial commitments. And this commitment will give us some additional properties. The commitment that Protodank Sharni is using is KCG polynomial commitment. I'll explain it in one slide. If you haven't seen this before, uh, this will give you a rough idea, but I highly encourage you to look into the paper. It's a very well written paper and it's easy to follow and see how everything works. And even the proofs pretty straightforward in this paper. It's a very elegant scheme. So we assume that we have three elliptic curve groups, G1, G2, and GT, with a bilinear pairing that will operate on the groups G1 and G2, will move effectively an element in G1 and an element in G2 to the group GT. This polynomial commitment scheme requires a trusted setup that will generate a structured reference string of this form. So G1 is a generator of the group G1. So the SRS is going to be of the form g1 to the power of tau, g1 to the power of tau squared, g1 to the power of tau cubed, etc. So there are going to be n powers of tau in this SRS. And the way I'm going to describe it, you only need one power tau in g2, but for efficiency reasons, you might want to generate several of those to do batch proving, which I'm not going to explain now. So the SRS should be generated in such a way that nobody knows tau. And when SRS is published, of course, in this groups, the discrete logarithm problem is hard. So given G1 to the tau, there is no way you can figure out tau unless you can break discrete logarithm. So KCG polynomial commitment allows you to commit to a polynomial of degree n. And this n is the same as the size of the SRS. So the polynomial is described as usual school book polynomial uh, representation. You have a coefficient, say 0, a1, a2, a n. And the polynomial is the sum of a0, a1 times x, a2 times x squared, etc. So all the usual nice stuff. You can commit to this polynomial with a very short element in G1. So I put it in gray just because I don't want to go into too much detail. But this commitment is effectively G1 to the power f of tau. And it's pretty remarkable because no matter the degree of the polynomial, it can be as large as you want, as long as it's smaller than the SRS you can still commit to a large polynomial with a constant size element. So CF binds you to the polynomial. There is no way without knowing tau to come up with another polynomial that will commit to the same C. In its constant size, it's just a single element in G1. Now to open a commitment, I can basically prove to you that the polynomial underneath the commitment evaluates to a certain value at a given point. And the proof is also very short. It's a single element in G1. Now the committer and the opener needs to know the polynomial. Now the verifier, in order to verify that the committed polynomial evaluates on no point alpha to some value beta, it only needs to know the short proof pi. So it's a very efficient way to convince somebody that the polynomial evaluates to a certain value with a very short proof. So the polynomial commitment scheme is basically these three functions, the commit, open, and verify. Now this polynomial commitment is binding. So the main property is it's polynomial binding and evolution binding. It's not possible uh, to come up with another polynomial that will commit to the same value. And it's also not possible to open this polynomial at the same point to two distinct values. So once you commit to the polynomial, you can only faithfully approve things about the uh, polynomial being committed there. All right, so that's the polynomial commitment scheme. And it can be viewed as a vector commitment because effectively you can commit this way to the vector of evaluations of this polynomial f. 
And then the prover can open selectively any elements of this factor commitment to convince the verifier of the selective opening of this commitment. So, as I mentioned, this scheme requires a trusted setup, and Ethereum is running a trusted setup right now. It's generating four powers of tau strings. The first string has 4,095 powers in G1 and 64 powers in G2. The size of this whole setup is about 200 kilobytes. Then there is a larger setup, twice as much powers in the G1, so up to tau to the 8,000, that's about 400 kilobytes. And then uh, you have larger and larger setups. Those are effectively two times the length of the previous strings. So 400 kilobytes and 1,600 kilobytes. And you can participate in the setups right now. It's basically every participant that shows up can re-randomize the string and add randomness to this DAO. And the whole process is engineered in such a way that as long as there is one honest participant who correctly contributes to the setup and completely erases and forgets the randomness used to participate, the whole setup is secure. So you can show that as long as one participant forgets the secrets in its contribution, nobody would know the tau. So these types of setups really benefit from a large number of participants because in a large number of participants, more likely somebody will be honest and will correctly erase all of the secrets and not keep them around. There is a link to participate. So the way this commitment scheme is used in protodank sharding, the data is treated as a vector of 4096 elements in ZP, where P is a prime, it's a order of G1 group of the BLS 12381 curve. So P is about 256 bits. So the data blob is just a vector of the 256 bit elements. Uh, that's about 130 kilobytes. We interpolate the polynomial through those values. So we create a polynomial of degree 4095 such that f of i equals yi. And uh, we know that such polynomial is going to be uniquely determined just because the number of points is 4096 and the degree for the polynomial is 4095. So such polynomials are always uniquely determined. And then the commitment to this data blob is the commitment to the polynomial, the KZG commitment. And the nice thing about KZG is I can show you selective disclosure of this data blob. I can prove to you that certain points I indeed correct values of the data blob and that they conform to the commitment that they generated in the first place by doing KZG openings on this polynomial F. So at the high level, we have our old transaction lists that Ethereum blocks contain. And then with protodank sharding, additionally, the block is going to contain the commitment to the data blobs and the data blobs themselves. Okay, so new Ethereum block is now going to consist of two parts. Uh, the old Ethereum block, commitments, and then data blobs. So the green is the block for execution, and it's going to be fully replicated to the validator set, so each validator is going to store the green block. But the yellow data blobs are blocks for storage. Those are for prototype sharding are also going to be fully replicated, but those are going to have an expiry of one to two months. So the Ethereum block size now comprises of two parts, 0.1 megabytes of data for execution and 0.5 megabytes of data for storage. So that's proto dank sharding. And uh, now let me explain you the dank sharding. Dank sharding uh, is an invention of Dan Feist from the Ethereum Foundation, and uh, it's even named after him. So dank in dank sharding stands for Dan So the idea is to apply erasure coding. So don't be scared. This erasure coding we're going to use is super simple. So our data blob. As I was explaining before, is the evaluation of a polynomial at points 1, 2, up to 4096. And we're going to continue evaluating this polynomial, evaluated at point 4097, 98, etc. So we're going to evaluate at 4096 more points. And this is going to be an extension of our data blob. Okay. So that's called Reed Solomon encoding or low degree polynomial extension. So you interpolate the polynomial through the first half through the data blob, and then you evaluate this polynomial at more point to extend the data blob to create this extension. Now, since the polynomial is of degree 4095, it means that any 4096 elements are enough to reconstruct F. So even if some of the elements of the extended data blob get corrupted, you can still reconstruct the original polynomial and reconstruct your data blob. So that allows us to do the dispersion of data. 
what we can do is uh, we're going to take this extended vector where there are 8192 elements and we're going to give each validator one element of this vector. Now, if some of the validators go Byzantine, go missing, they drop their fragments, as long as 50% of validators are honest and correctly keep their fragments, we can always reconstruct all of the data from just 50% of it, just because of those properties on the polynomial that any uh, half of the elements are enough to reconstruct F. All right. So this is an initial idea, we're going to make it more efficient, but for now, the commitment to the polynomial F is going to be fully replicated to the validator set, but the actual vector is going to be split into fragments and each validator is going to get one evaluation of this polynomial. And the question is how the validators know that they got correct fragments. Well, they get the commitment opening proofs for their fragments from the block builder. So the block builder is going to do some heavy computation to not only extend the data blob by evaluating the polynomial at more points, dispersing the elements to the validators, it will also produce evaluation opening proofs to convince the validators that the fragments that they got correspond to the actual commitments. So how do we apply these ideas to multiple data blobs or a block? Because it's not very useful for a single vector. Well, it's pretty straightforward. So in Ding sharding, the number of data blobs is up to 256. So that's about 32x increase from draw to Ding sharding. So we're going to extend each uh, data blob individually the same way I explained before. And then we're going to split the extended block into columns and each file data will receive a column of this extended block. So as long as 50% of validators are honest, they can always piece the block back together because every row can be interpolated and can be corrected for erasures if you only have 50% of elements in it. So then sharding goes a step further. This scheme already works. There is one annoying part where you might want to use some more complicated tools, and that's the locality of the reconstruction. So right now, if the validator is missing its column, the way to get it back is uh, to try to reconstruct the whole block effectively. So this poor validator will have to talk to the whole validator set to try to get 50% of columns, then do the interpolation to reconstruct his missing fragment. So that's not great because the blocks and the indent sharding are really large. Those are 30 megabyte blocks. So that's going to take a lot of effort on the validator side. And the hope is that validators can be really light, that this will not add uh, a lot of burden on the validators. So for that, Dink sharding does another step. So let me explain how Dink sharding achieves local reconstructability. How do we make sure that the validators can reconstruct its missing fragment with few other fragments without going to the full validator set, without doing full reconstruction? Right, so right now, the, the validator is missing its fragment, needs to reconstruct the whole block. But to get local reconstruction, uh, Dink sharding needs two additional properties uh, of the commitment scheme. It needs homomorphism of the commitments, so the commitment to one to polynomial F plus the commitment to polynomial G gives you the commitment to polynomial F plus G. So you can add up the commitment, and this will cause the polynomials to add up. KCG commitments are homomorphic. Uh, bulletproofs commitments are homomorphic. Fry commitments are not, for example. So we have plenty of examples of homomorphic commitments, and that's what we're going to need for this step for Dink sharding. And the other property we will need is homomorphism on the proofs. And that's a tricky property, and we only know of KZG commitments that achieve both, that achieve homomorphism on the commitments and homomorphism on the proofs. Unfortunately, KZG commitments require a trusted setup, so that's an open problem of how to construct the commitment scheme with both properties without a trusted setup. There's some work being done in the groups of unknown order that's pretty recent, but the homomorphism of the proofs property says that you can add the proofs. So you can now take the opening proof for the polynomial F and point alpha, and you can add it to the proof for the polynomial G at point alpha. And this will effectively be the same proof as for the opening of the sum of the polynomials. Okay, so those two homomorphic properties are required to make Dink sharding achieve local reconstructability. So here is how these properties are used. So the way I explained it before, we were using univariate polynomials and we were evaluating those univariate polynomials at more points to create this extension on the right. 
Now, you can also treat the whole block as a bivariate polynomial. So you can fit a bivariate polynomial D through this left part and evaluate it at more points on the right. And you can also evaluate it at more points extending down. Now, extension to the right is equivalent to the univariate case. But extension down can also be done in a univariate fashion if you fit a univariate polynomial through each column and evaluate it at more points, but it's much nicer to view it as a bivariate polynomial evaluation. So that's how it's done. You basically do 2x expansion to the right and 2x expansion down. And now with this expanded block, uh, each validator is going to get two rows and two columns of data. So let me just explain a little more detail. Each validator is getting from the builder all of the commitments. So C1 through C256, those are commitments to the vectors of the original block. Now it also gets from the builder two rows of extended block and two columns. Columns will be slightly larger. It's going to be columns of width 16. This is done in order to make the scheme a little bit more efficient because you can do evaluation opening proof on 16 elements and they're also going to be short. So the proof size for opening 16 elements is the same as a proof size opening a single element. It also is more friendly to the network because you're sending a little bit more data so your packets are more full. That's just a technicality for why it's a 16 width column. But you can think of it as the validator getting two rows and two columns. So that's about two megabytes per validator per block. Now to verify the elements in the bottom half, we need the commitment scheme to be homomorphic because those extension is a linear transformation on the block. Wherever you're interpolating the polynomial and evaluating at more points, that's actually a linear transformation on the vectors that you're doing. So you can translate this linear transformation and extend the vector of polynomials to also cover uh, the bottom half rows of this matrix. And that's how you can verify that you actually got the correct row, that your row corresponds to the commitments. You can use the homomorphism to extend these commitments and then check that your row commits to the extended commit. But for the columns, each validator is going to get the proofs from the builder. And it, again, for those at the bottom part, it's going to just check against the commitments, these green commitments for the top part and for the bottom part, the commitments are going to be extended and you're going to be checking again against these bottom commitments. Each validator can now locally reconstruct its missing pieces. So if the validator, say, is missing a column, it's going to ask other validators who are storing the rows and who are intersecting, obviously, this column of the validator to supply this validator with fragments of his column. And the moment it gets 50% of elements in the column, it will be able to reconstruct and fulfill the whole column. And that's where we need homomorphism on the proofs as well, because when you are fulfilling elements of the column, you also want to fulfill proofs for these elements. And fulfilling the proofs will require homomorphism for the proofs. So that's how local reconstructability works. So again, the properties that we need from the commitment scheme from during charting is homomorphism on the commitments, homomorphism on the proofs, and only KSG has both properties. So the reason Deng charting extends the block both ways, it extends right to get resilience against malicious 50% of validators because validators are getting columns and half of the validators can forget their columns, you will still be able to reconstruct the original block. And Deng sharding extends down in order to get local reconstruction, in order to allow the validators to reconstruct their missing columns or rows without doing full block reconstruction. So let's talk about reconstruction briefly. The way uh, it's proposed to be done in Deng sharding is if 75% of elements in the block are there, then at least one incomplete row or column will be reconstructable, will have at least 50% of elements in it. So you'll find such a row or column and you will reconstruct it, basically patching your gap. Then you'll find maybe a column with 50% of elements and you'll patch that. And you will repeat this iterative process until you reconstruct all the missing pieces. Now, we know that we require 75% of the block in the worst case. And the worst case is here. If you're having 75% of the block, and this is the yellow part, minus some tiny strip, minus epsilon. So you're missing a little bit of this corner here. So this yellow area, including the striped one, is 75% minus epsilon. 
So given only this area, you will not be able to patch and reconstruct this missing white quarter because none of the rows or columns will have 50% of elements in it. And this worst case is very real because validators are getting rows and columns, so it might happen that the data goes missing in exactly this pattern and you uh, get this worst case. So while exploring this with Dan Benet, we wrote a blog post, by the way, that you can check out on the A16Z website, but we also had a proposal there of improving the reconstruction by having the validators, instead of storing rows and columns, store some randomly dispersed uh, data from the block. So let me explain in a few words how it works. So instead of going through row and column-wise reconstruction, we can go through bivariate interpolation. So instead of doing this iterative process where you're finding incomplete rows and columns, uh, you try to reconstruct uh, your bivariate polynomial as a whole. So this new method allows to reconstruct from 25% with high probability when this 25% are randomly distributed across a block. So instead of rows and columns, the validators, we propose to give the validators random elements from the block. It remains an open question, however, how to do bivariate interpolation efficiently. So let me show you a polynomial time algorithm for bivariate interpolation, but it's not good enough for us. So if each validator gets random elements of the block, the elements from honest validators are going to be randomly distributed across the block. So your task is now to patch for the missing white elements. So the yellow are the elements that you have and the white elements are the ones that are missing. So the polynomial that we are seeking for is a polynomial of two variables. It has degree n minus one in each variable. So it has n squared coefficients. And given n squared random evaluations, we need to obtain the coefficients of this polynomial. So each evaluation that we have here, those elements that are present, gives us a single linear equation on the coefficients of this polynomial. So here the coordinates x, y, you can write the equation on the coefficients of this polynomial. So each element ha gives one equation. So now we can write it as a system of equations. So those are our unknowns, the coefficients of the polynomial. The matrix M is constructed this way from the coordinates of the evolution points, I1, J1, I2, J2, etc. So they're going to be N squared points that are present in the block. N squared unknowns, so you should theoretically be able to find those unknowns given those N squared evaluations on the left. And indeed, the solving linear system, we know how to do it in polynomial time. For general matrices, it takes time n to the 2.37 if you use the best algorithms. In our case, however, n is really large, it's 2 to the 32. So the size of this matrix is 128 gigabytes. So that's not a practical approach, although uh, it's kind of an efficient algorithm just for our sizes, it's not suitable. But we know that the matrix is very structured, so the better algorithms should exist. So it would be nice to come up with a better bivariate interpolation algorithms, and this will improve the reconstruction. Now let me talk about data availability sampling and how it fits into the picture for Deng sharding. So in Deng sharding, the blocks are reconstructable from 75% or possibly lower if we can make bivariate interpolation faster. So to understand whether the block is available, the sampling client is kind of going to throw random darts into this block matrix, hoping to find out any missing pieces. So the sampling client will request random element of the block. It will send the coordinate ij to the validator set, and the validator set is going to reply with the value of the polynomial dij and a proof. We assume here that the client have the commitments to the block, so it will be able to verify that it got back the correct value. So the probability that the value comes back and it is correct, but the block is unavailable is 0.75, and that matches the 75%. So imagine that your block is unavailable, so more than 25% of it is missing, only 75% minus epsilon is present, so the probability that you hit the present element, yet too much of the block is missing for reconstruction, is 0.75. The probability that you do it again, so you do it two times in a row, is 0.75 squared. And by repeating the sampling, you can amplify this probability and goes down exponentially quickly. So you can make it negligible with small number of queries. 
And if with bivariate interpolation, we can uh, improve on the 75%, make it 25%, then the probability will go down even faster. So data availability sampling allows our client to verify whether the data is available without basically knowing any information about the validator set, without knowing the public keys of the validators, without verifying any signatures, but just simply throwing uh, these darts into the block and verifying that it got back correct values from the set. And this is also going to underline the consensus design in Ethereum because data availability or dank sharding is going to be blended into the consensus protocol. So each validator during the attestation phase in the consensus uh, will attest to the block BN only if the two conditions are met. If this validator has sampled all the previous blocks and the sampling was successful, so with good probability the validator is convinced that all the previous blocks are available, so it determines availability of the previous blocks, and it also attests if it received correct fragments of all the previous blocks. So this green lines, two rows and two columns, each validator gets uh, for each block, and it needs to verify that those conform to the commitments. If those two conditions are met, then the validator attests to the block BN. And that's happening in addition to what Ethereum consensus is doing right now, which is verifying and rerunning all the transactions within the block. It will also verify that this additional data that we're adding with Dink sharding is available. All right, so uh, that's all I have. Here are the important disclosures to check out. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And please uh, check out the blog post that we wrote with Dan Bonet. And yeah, let us know your thoughts.